Welcome to Man Cove Wellbeing and the My Trauma, Your Trauma series with me, Owen Morgan. I want to share my trauma journey and that of others. We will also look at the world of trauma healing, support and research, including guests who specialize in helping those overcome their trauma. My Trauma, Your Trauma is here to explore human experience. Welcome to Trauma Chat, where we invite on guests to talk all things trauma. Please watch and listen with care. Some of this content may be triggering or may make you feel uncomfortable, so do press that stop button and take a break. Always put yourself first. I'm a mental health advocate sharing my lived experience. I'm a massage therapist, wellness audiobook addict, can never say that, and a stepdad to my amazing four-year-old. I've interviewed hundreds of wellness experts and people with stories of overcoming their wellness struggles. I myself have suffered with childhood abuse from child minders, severe school bullying, a deep depression in my 20s, and blackout anxiety, plus a life-threatening illness in my early 30s. I want to give a voice to those who can inspire others to improve wellness. I'm here with Christina Giamalva of Peace Piece by piece. <laughs> She's a transformational counselor with somatic approach to depression, anxiety, stress, and trauma, helping those to reduce fear. Uh, sorry, helping those to reduce fear to be their true best self. Christina incorporates a range of techniques and approaches from neuroscience and positive psychology to Eastern. Uh, I can never say it, Christina, help me out. Philosophy. That's the one. Right. I think I mostly did that intro okay. How are we today, Christina? I'm great, Owen, and I'm just so grateful to be here with you as well. Thank you for inviting me on. Yeah, no problem. As soon as, you know, when I'm doing my Instagram scanning and I see people I think look awesome, I saw one of your videos, I was like, oh my God, she's really cool. I've got to get her on. And here we are. The rest is history. Um, and I think your Instagram is excellent as well. And I love the messages that you're communicating to such a large audience about trauma, destigmatizing trauma, and really creating access to information and tools so that we can have fewer and fewer of us living with trauma in our system. So I'm grateful for the work you're doing. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's something, as my audience know, I'm super passionate about. And I think it, trauma can be talked about in a fairly light manner, even if it is quite heavy. It can be the way it's said and the way it's shared and safely. It doesn't have to be as heavy yes. as you think, which is amazing. So um, I always start with this because it's completely relative right now. How has this crazy 2020 been for you so far? Well, you know, the virus I actually have seen um, I'm fortunate enough to still have a roof over my head. I still get to work. I have clients. So I feel very, very fortunate that I am not um, without, you know, resources. Having said that, I have three grown daughters living at home with me and a grown husband. So the five of us all under one roof, um, all of us working, you know, can have its moments of challenge. Um, and at the same time, I think it's been a gift because there's no opportunities to avoid or deny or escape challenging situations. And we have had our share. So during this time, we've been able to use a lot of the tools that um, I learned in order to deal with the stress that I had had um, growing up um, with my family. And so I feel like, you know, there is a blessing to this very, very difficult time. And that is that people are being given the chance and the opportunity to sit with the underlying angst and issues that have maybe been brought to a boiling point because of the virus. Yeah, thank you. And it's a chance, like you said, a chance to see things more clearly, to kind of yes. see what you've not been bringing awareness to because of the crazy busyness of life. An opportunity to grow too for so many of us. So many people I've yes. spoken to, they've started to move back towards things they wish they'd always done and hobbies they've always thought about and instruments they've wanted to learn. And, you know, it's it's been tough, but there's also been joy in there too. Um, and I hope we all come out of this. I'm hoping we all come out of this more connected as a human race, but we'll see. 
Well, I like I like that question that you posit. It's up to each of us to make that individual decision. And um, so I feel definitely more connected, especially to the people that I work with. And I just feel that there's this greater vulnerability right now because of the unknown that is really asking, you know, each of us, can I feel safe with you? Because, right, this virus makes us feel very unsafe in our environment. So we're kind of like very tepid testing the waters out. Is it safe to be next to you? Is it safe to talk with you? And so I find that there's, you know, if we can be gentle and open with others, that's what we're really looking for for ourselves. That same tenderness, you know, that same vulnerability. And so I'm hoping, just as you are, that we, one by one, get to this greater intimacy of relationship with humanity. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that about the safety thing, because as you say, it's an un- the uncertainty may make us feel unsafe, and which is why we will then look for safety in and around our life and that's a time to reflect on that you know what feels safe what doesn't um i hope that's been the case i was literally on the way home to speak with you today i was listening to a podcast with uh rick hansen and and his son forrest and he had steve they had stephen porges on and they were talking about yes they listened to it yeah they were talking about you know the polyvagal um approach everything that's happening with the virus and stuff and he said exactly what you're saying there which is all of us are kind of feeling very uncertain and safe at this this threat that we cannot see. Um, so we are having to look for other safety cues around us. So I'm hoping people have had the chance to reflect on that and what really matters to them and the people who are really there for them. And that's very beautiful. So let's hope um, that is the case for so many. But yeah, thank you. Thank you for answering that. Because I know that once this virus is all over, I will no longer be answering that question. So it seems very relevant right now. <laughs> um, so hopefully it will be over soon. So uh, before we sort of dive into what we're talking about today, we've got lots to cover. Um, I know that much. Uh, do you want to just let the audience know a little bit more about kind of y- your work that you're up to at the moment? This isn't so much about where you've been, but what you're doing um, in the present day with your work. Sure. So um, I am what I call a transformational counsellor. Um, and I use a hybrid of approaches, as you mentioned in the intro, working one-on-one with clients, really trying to have people live less from fear and more from clarity, which is, you know, and we're going to get into this more um, intimately and discreetly, which is why don't we live more from clarity? What inhibits us? And so what I find is people come to me because they're stressed, they're anxious, they're struggling, and they're like, I want to be happy, and I don't like what's happening in my life. And so um, I spend, um, you know, five days a week, uh, six or seven hours a day, meeting with individuals, um, trying to help them digest fear, process fear, and find truth, which is really what is innately good about them. What qualities and essence do they uniquely have that makes their life meaningful? And how can they live from that perspective more and more? So that's what I'm up to now. I also teach a course online called The Fundamentals of Wellbeing uh, with another um, colleague of mine, where we teach the essentials of understanding like why are we unhappy and what is, you know, what's the root of unhappiness and how can we get happy? Um, and we teach this practice. So um, that's what I'm up to right now. Oh, that's amazing. And, you know, ha- happy happiness, it could be a bit of a loaded word, a bit complicated at times. Um, so it's really good that, you know, courses like that are out there because people kind of sometimes forget that you have to feel all your feelings. You can't be constantly on the hunt for happiness. So it's trying to, to understand that is probably the key to happiness, isn't it? Is, is realizing that you can't always be. Yes. And, you know, I was listening to another podcast called Befriending Your Anxiety. And um, McLaren, I think, is the woman's last name. I apologize that I can't remember her. For Carla McLaren. But she has such a great statement, which is she says there are four quadrants of emotions. There's the happiness quadrant. There's the fear quadrant. You know, fear is resistance, you know, anxiety. Then there's the anger quadrant, which is frustration, irritation, disappointment. 
And then there is the sad quadrant, which is, you know, grief and sadness and loss. Well, guess what? For most of us, we want to avoid three quarters of the emotion, you know, rainbow. And we only want to focus on the 25%, the happiness. When in reality, how we get to happiness, which is contentment, acceptance, peace, is by actually allowing ourselves to experience the other 75% of emotions, not resist them. Yeah, that's a really nice analogy, actually, with the, I see pie charts now and just seeing that big percentage chunk being avoided, disassociate from all of these things, which is, I guess, you know, so much of, you know, addiction pathways and stuff. So much of addiction is, is not being in those quadrants. And our society, you know, our societies have discouraged us from seeing the benefits of allowing ourselves to digest these other emotions. And I love what she says. What if we didn't see emotions as positive or negative, but they were just on a spectrum and they all serve a purpose? For example, a life well lived or a pet that we love so much that passes away, we have loss and grief as an homage to that experience. And so we then see that all these different emotions, they come through, they come through us as, you know, a washing. They're not here to stay, but if we resist them, they're going to bang on that door. And then they are going to act like we're, they're going to imprison us because they want to be experienced. Yeah, it's kind of... Um... Is it impermanent? So nothing, nothing's permanent um, with, with this, you know, experience is always going to be the only thing I think. So the only thing that's yes. permanent is that it's not permanent. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's, um, it's, and, um, exactly. You know, time and time again on the last few episodes or two, we talk about how so much that suffering is resistance. So you suffer because you're resisting. Yes. Um, and I really, really like that way of thinking, seeing it. And my partner talk about this. Me and my partner talk a lot about how, Life is suffering, and that's not meant to be a depressive statement. We're just saying life is suffering, life is joy, life is pain, life is love, and it's it's how it's been able to observe that from from a compassionate space right. rather than getting too hooked in. I like to say that life has pain in it, right? Birth, death, disease, and we have difficult moments. The suffering actually is optional. The suffering is our beliefs about what is happening that causes the suffering, right? That it shouldn't be happening to us, that it, or it should have been happening to us. Either we're craving something that we're not getting, or we're trying to avert and avoid something that we might have to get. That's really that suffering actually is optional and the pain is not, you know, when we lose somebody that's close to us or when we lose a job or we end a relationship or a parent dies far too young, that is painful, but that it shouldn't have happened to us. That's the suffering. And as you said, that's where the resistance comes in. When we apply these beliefs to what is actually happening in reality thank you yeah it's a really nice way to look at i i love people giving me these little amazing paragraphs that i can use so thank you for giving me more more content that i can add to my wisdom bank thank you which is absolutely amazing so today we're going to talk about uh elements of the therapy work that you do um also a little bit about your story so i ask everybody the same question and any of our loyal fan base will know what's coming which is for you, what is your definition of trauma? So for me, I like to say that on a spectrum, there is a spectrum of fear that happens to one. And if we cannot handle what is happening to us in a moment, our system goes on override and fear gets enacted and we can't manage and what ends up happening is our nervous system our body gets traumatized so i would say that anything where our window of tolerance 
is past of what we can tolerate in life. And for some, you know, it might be being yelled at might, you know, they might leave a window of tolerance if their mom yells at them. And for someone else, they don't leave the window of tolerance when a parent yells at them. It might be being left at the bus stop when we're little. It can be very small events that can cause one to leave their window of tolerance, or it can be a very significant you know, event such as the loss of a parent or uh, having a very traumatizing act upon us, an act of violence, or it can be a car accident or being injured in some way, falling off a bike. You know, I, I just recently saw on Instagram this brave little five-year-old protected his younger sibling from getting attacked by a dog, but he got attacked by the dog in, while defending his younger sister. Now, I believe that little boy will have trauma in his system because at such a young age, even though he was fearless, you know, he just was so brave to go in front of him that a physical attack on his body, I'm sure, dysregulated his nervous system out of his control. It was completely not his choice. But I'm sure it will have an impact on his nervous system that he will have to process at some point. Thank you. That's so true. You know, you know, he's he will. I always think about the main part. Think about this with kids uh, all the time that there will be a level of trauma. Lots of small things will happen. Then so many people have issues in school, and these things happen. The problem is because we're not trauma informed as parents. Uh, well, me, and my me, and my partner are, but we're saying that the majority of parents aren't trauma informed. So these things never get dealt with. They never get processed. So it then leads to whatever happens to them as adults. So it's this is kind of like with the work you're doing, the work we're doing. We're trying to. We really want the next generation to be trauma informed, so they can see these things happening. And go right. What what do what does your nervous system need? What can we do to help you sit with this pain and flow through it and and let it process complete all the words you want to use? And I really hope that we can get as many people as we can trauma informed as possible. Um, yes. Well, there's a great uh, woman that does work. For young people, her name is Becky Bailey. I don't know if you have read her work, which is great about how do we help children process trauma in a given day? And I don't know, there's also a very funny titled book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And I'm not sure if you know that book, but what I love about that is how in the natural kingdom, uh, you know, animals, why don't they have trauma? It's because on a daily basis, they have nervous systems just like we do. We have nervous systems just like they do, right? They go into the sympathetic. They go into the dorsal vagal, as we'll talk about later. But So then why don't they have this suppressed trauma? It's because on a daily basis, an animal knows how to actually slough off their fear. They do this shaking process. And we see ducks do it, let's say, if they're kind of going in for a piece of food together and they'll quack really loudly at each other and they'll diverge and separate. And then we'll watch the ducks. They'll rapidly, ravagely shake their wings. And what they're doing is they're sloughing off the, you know, stress hormones that were released while they were trying to get the food. We don't do that. And that's why we suppress this fear in our nervous system. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because you think we're so advanced and intelligent and wise and like we're at the top of the food chain, but then we can learn so much <laughs> more from our, our predecessors, can't we? Um, it's it's so fascinating yes. to see that because I think sometimes we're, we're too intelligent for our own good. I think I think we've we've our evolution has gone has gone too far in one direction and we've not been able to keep up um, with the crazy world that we've built for ourselves because uh, we've certainly done that. Um, this is already amazing stuff. We've not even got onto our questions yet. It's amazing. <laughs> um, so for yourself personally, you know, most therapists will say that there's things that happened to them that led them to to what they do. And we don't need to go in massive depth here unless you want to. But, right. you know, have you had any, have you suffered yourself with any mental, mo emotional health struggles on your journey? I have. I suffered from trauma myself. I didn't know it at the time. Um and I would say that I was in denial of my trauma in that I felt that I, you know, 
grew up, I was well taken care of. You know, I got to go to a good school. My parents got divorced when I was very young, three. My parents, my mother moved very far away from my father, um, 2,500 miles away from him. So I did not see him very much uh, at all. And I didn't realize that how, you know, what was happening in my childhood, the kind of emotional neglect as my mother was trying to refine herself and make a new life for herself and not really having a dad on a daily basis and really having very attentive caregivers, you know, not having that really affected my, you know, I had an unhealthy sense of self that it activated my nervous system beyond the window of tolerance. I didn't know that at the time. I just had anxiety and I just felt that, you know, I was a kind of that quote unquote type A personality, high strung, nervous. I didn't realize what that was. At the same time, um, I could tell that I was experiencing depression um, in my very early 20s while still in college. I had my first panic attack. Um, <laughs> I stood up in the middle of a philosophy class of 200 people and shouted very loudly, we're all going to die. No, that did not go over very well. <laughs> After that, you know, because my heart raced, I was, so, you know, so freaked out. I took myself to the, you know, the mental health center at my university and they wanted to prescribe me medication. And I did not want to take medication. I wanted to understand what had happened to me. Like, what is this thing that just overwhelmed my whole system? And this is, you know, in the early 80s, they hadn't even come up with the term panic attack yet. I coined it. For, I actually called it a panic attack because, I'm, you know, and whoever coined it, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Whoever coined that term, that's what it was for me. So um, I suffered for panic attacks for the next 20 years. Uh, in it, you know, on and off, they would manifest around particular issues. I didn't understand what was happening again to my system. Um, and then I would say that when I had my children, um, and I had my first child when I was 28, I would say that what happened was my trauma got reactivated, it got triggered. So a new stimulus, which was Having my first daughter, I began to relive what the neglect felt like from my parents. And I I could kind of feel it like when my mother came to visit and somewhat ignored my daughter when she was, you know, a baby. And then when she was three, it felt very, you know, uncomfortable and, and unsettling to me. And I was very agitated, but again, had no idea that this was just, you know, triggers of past trauma. I had no idea of that. And it wasn't until uh, I was 40, and I'm 55 now, that um, I then got into therapy because I was suffering from depression. Um, and I just felt like I couldn't stand me anymore. It just felt very heavy. Um, I would describe it that I had like lead attached to my feet. I'd wake up feeling very you know, heavy. And, it, you know, I had a beautiful husband, lovely life, really great family. Why, why was I waking up feeling morose? Like it made no sense to me. And so I began um, seeing somebody and, you know, I so believe in what is meant to be the therapist that I saw be, was a somatic therapist. And I began doing uh, this work, this embodiment work. And I began to understand that, yes, I could understand the neglect and what had happened to me as a child. I could rationalize it. My parents just didn't know better. But my body did not come to that understanding. And that my body, for every experience that I had, my body had what's called an implicit memory. And that implicit memory had to also be processed, to be digested in order to free myself from my anxiety and my stress and my depression. And so I did that work uh, for many years. It took me quite a while. And simultaneously, 
I began a practice of Buddhist philosophy. And this is where I feel I might be different than a traditional therapist in that the Eastern philosophy practice really helped me understand that a lot of my emotions that I was having were not coming from the outside, that I was the cause of my own fire, that only I can create my own emotional homeostasis, and that I, the only way that I was going to get out of this fire, the only way to put out this fire, was if I did what I call the U-turn, you know, where I turned within and I began to examine what was going on within myself during a moment. Why am I triggered by this? Why is that moment triggering me? Instead of blaming the outside stimulus for the cause of my reaction, I began to do the U-turn and see what was getting activated in my system. And then I began to uncover that I had these, you know, implicit memories in my body that had also gotten attached to false limiting beliefs like, I'm not good enough. I'm unlovable. I'm going to be abandoned. And I was really avoiding those feelings. And when I say feelings, I mean what it felt like in my body. To When, when I would get triggered, that sense of, I'm not good enough, or I'm going to be abandoned. I had a physiologic sense in my body, and I was trying to avoid it. And I was avoiding it in a very unhealthy way, you know, by overachieving or trying to merge with other people, by being too much of a caretaker, really doing the exact opposite of what might have been healthy in that moment. So you know, I would say about seven years ago, um, it really began to settle. I had this profound shift where I feel like my nervous system reset. And I, at the moment, at that moment, didn't know what had happened to me because there was such peace within my system. This sense of, like, I just stabilization, relaxation, it's all okay. Even though things were happening on the outside that were kind of challenging at that mo- at those moments. And that's when I began studying then and wanting to be a therapist and apply the techniques that it so helped me find this inner peace, peace by peace. I wanted then to offer to others. So I then went on retreats, uh, started studying, taking courses online. Uh, I have had great mentors, uh, listened to great books, and um, then started being a practitioner of this um, about four years ago. Wow, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. And there was so many golden nuggets in there. Um, but I was. Thank you. I hope that's okay that I go. I I can go off. <laughs> no, no, it was amazing. And you know, I'm always trying to get those key points that people say so I can throw them back at you. And or one of the things that you brought up there, which I thought was very powerful for many a parent, is like you said. You know, you you see how you were parented reflected when you become one. Um, I've heard this time and time again with a lot of people is that you can be triggered by your own child, but it's not actually a child triggering you. It's your inner child triggering you. Um, and the way you parent can be massively impacted on, you know, you may be an avoidant parent, so you, as in you don't want to discipline your child at all because that might have been your 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 story for you. Um, but then you may not meet the needs of the child, which needs structure. So not discipline, but structure. Exactly. And I was actually an insecurely attached, based on the attachment theory model. I was an insecurely attached child. Fortunately for my children, my husband is a securely attached child. So there was some balance uh, and some sense of like, you know, it's all okay that, you know, some grounded presence as well, because, you know, I could barely handle my kids crying without running to the crib because, you know, I, I couldn't tolerate. It just activated my nervous system so quickly. 
Yeah, it's huge. And, you know, another thing you mentioned near the beginning of the uh, the episode, was, which is about, you know, how trauma doesn't need to be stuff that happens to us. It's stuff that never happens to us um, that can be traumatic too from you know, abandonment issues and neglect. And that's horrendously traumatizing considering we are wired to, you know, seek connection. And I've read a lot of um, or listened to a lot of books talking about, you know, this kind of thing and how the child needs to get their needs met so they will adapt the way they are to to get their caretaker to see them and look after them so that can develop some very unhealthy habits um to to get those needs met um and it kind of opens up this whole conversation around how parenting is very complicated but at the same time i think the key elements of it aren't complicated the key elements of what you need to provide your child isn't actually that complicated from a perspective of nurturing safe attachment and it's it's interesting isn't it because i don't think it's as hard as we think it is but it is very complicated isn't it if that makes sense it well, no, I, you know it's easy in a textbook right go ahead and try to live it <laughs> i mean i feel very lucky that um you know my children are grown now my youngest is 20 um and at the same time i feel that my young adult children are interested in this um, understanding, this paradigm of understanding. And so now they are, you know, attuned to their nervous systems. They're attuned to, you know, what needs aren't being met of theirs and having the capacity to see, you know, if you can't meet my need, how can I meet my own need? You know, and so that's really what is essential here is how can we help our children, you know, articulate what is a need that needs to be met. And we're not, you know, yes, we have the fundamentals, the basic, right, for survival is shelter, food, and safety. But then we have more, you know, that um, the emotional needs. We have to feel safe. We have to feel connected. We need to feel love. We need to feel able to be curious. We need to feel able to feel the ability to play. And all of these capacities need to be met. And so what most children do is they come to the parent and they're like, is it okay to go do this? And they do this non-verbally. I think it's around an I don't want to miss, be mistaken with my percentage, but I think it's around 93% of how we communicate is non-verbally. In other words, our body cues, we, we can read uh, the muscle tension in another's face, around the mouth and the eyes. We can feel the vibration of tone, how we communicate to one another, and how open our body is. Are our shoulders rolled in? Are we open? Are we pressing the chest forward? Are we slunk in? All of these nonverbal cues are messages to our children about safety. And we are telling our children yes or no by our body language of yes, it's safe to do this, or no, it's dangerous to do that. So, as you were saying, I think it might sound easy, but I would say the greatest gift that we can give to our children is to find a way to be with our own fears, to digest these fears within ourselves to the best of our abilities, to be conscious that a unconscious fear might be, you know, what's motivating your behavior to tell your kid that they can't stay up an hour extra or why they can't have the extra chocolate chip cookie, that we might want to investigate when we're being rigid, inflexible, that there might be some fear there. And could we question ourselves? And just by questioning ourselves, what we're actually doing is we're actually shifting from one part of our brain, the rigid part of our brain is the reptilian part of our brain that needs to feel safety. And when we're curious, we're moving to this newer part, you know, 100,000 years old part of our brain, the cerebral frontal cortex. And when we're curious here, we have so much greater wisdom, access to clarity, patience and understanding. So just by questioning ourselves, we move our awareness to this different part of our brain. We access this, and then we might find, oh, it's an extra cookie, or sure, an extra 30 minutes, or it's, you know, we lighten up. That could be a great gift. Yeah, it certainly does. It makes me reflect a lot on my stepson, you know, and 
just seeing the way he is and how mind blowing it is to see how aware they actually are. We don't give them enough credit. There's a lot of people say, you know, ah, they don't remember anything up to this point. I'm like, oh. um, I totally, <laughs> that's totally not true. I'm watching him. He bloody remembers everything. Um, I could have said something six months ago and he brings it up. He remembers everything um, because they're looking. And if he doesn't remember it verbally, he remembers it implicitly. His body will remember it. That is guaranteed. I didn't, sorry to interrupt you, but what they found, one of the studies that they found is that children that had a dysregulated situation from birth to two months old, from birth to two months old, if they had a very difficult situation, they could be traumatized for the rest of their life. So, that shows us that the implicit memory, what the body stored, how the nervous system created its sense of safety, because it is developed between birth and seven, will affect us for the rest of our life. So yes, you're so right about your stepson and what he is recalling. Yeah, well, to take, you know, Bezel's words, body keeps the score. Um, I, th I think you can actually convince people with the language you use. So you can change your words and can just about convince them, but you can't convince them through your body. Your body will give you away. Oh, it will love it that. will go against you. It, it won't go against you. I mean, it will, it, the body won't lie for you. It's like, no, I'm going to be truthful right now. Um, and you see that with people's postures, their tone of voice. You know, I, 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 I like to people watch. I find it really interesting. I find it interesting to think, you know, what's going, you know, what's their story, what's going on for them, look at the way they hold their shoulders. And I just find it with all, com all with compassion, I just find it very interesting um, what's going on with people, you know, and, and, you know, even with, with, with our little one and stuff, he, he, he had, like you said, that memory in the body, it's very interesting. We take him to certain situations that we haven't taken to him for like two years and he will somehow stop bringing up memories around it. I'm like, that's, that's crazy Cogn cognitively, but I'm remembering that his body's probably has cues of, of memory. And yes. then he's creating this narrative to say, I remember when we were here and then we did this and we did this. And it's probably all encoded in, in that. And it's, um, adults, you know. Well, remember in your, one of your last, um, you had a great uh, Instagram clip about the polyvagal theory. And I love how Deb, Deva, Deb Dana communicates that 80% of what we take in is what's called bottom up. In other words, we take in an experience mostly first through the body, that there are more motor neurons in our tummy and in our heart area that are kind of translating safety and danger. Then they send a message to the brain to translate a belief, a thought, and then it spits it out. So for your son who might've gone to a joyful place, I'm sure what comes up is, right? He gets excited, exuberant, and then he starts you know, translating that experience. On the other hand, he might have gone to the dentist or something, and that wasn't such an exuberating experience. And so he might seem more cowardish. And like, because his memory of that, the body memory is like, yikes, that did not feel good. And then the mind is going to now come up to the story. I remember the dentist, you know, he seemed mean, he didn't seem caring, or, you know, or he might try to rationalize, like, are you sure? I don't think my teeth are that dirty, you know, trying to keep him away from that. So the mind actually is oftentimes just trying to translate the body's experience. And I think that's such an important insight for us because then we don't take our thoughts so seriously. You know, we have so much more compassion that maybe that negative thought, that negative judgment about ourselves, is really just trying to tell us, whoo, you're scared about something within. And could you, you know, stop, drop, drop in, turn within and see, is there something within myself that might need to be tended to? Because I'm having a negative judgment right now of another or of myself. I hope that's useful to others. It certainly is. And the thing is, you you know, I'm sure you are, you, you can listen to all these audio books and you get this particular page. You're like, oh, my God. And then you, it's just more information that you've got to think about. And I was listening to um, it was a Deb Dana interview and she was talking about 
I think it's from her new book where she has all those exercises, you know, exercise yeah. self-regulation. I was talking to my partner about this because obviously mindful awareness is is tied into this, but she was talking about from um, a neuroception perspective, because I, I always thought the neuroception was what you have with another human. But then she was explaining how you walk into a room and it's just neuroception party, basically. So your body's trying to get a sense of the space and things it remembers. So maybe the TV is shaped in a way that reminds you of something bad that happened to you. So your body's like taking all this info, computing it, sending it up. The brain's like, cool, not useful, useful. Um, and if you actually take a moment for a few minutes just to sit in a space and tune into your neuroception and look around at things and listen to things and see what your, your nervous system does, I've done it for about a week. It's amazing. You're like, oh, interesting that, that the way that person's walking is I can feel it affecting me. And when you actually do that mindful neuroception awareness, it can change your whole perspective of, sense of self like what sets you off yes. what's beautiful what's safe what's not and um well, i love it it's amazing if, if you don't mind me just i'd like to enhance what you're saying about the neuroceptors because it's such a great insight we have the external and the introceptors so what we're noticing right we're taking in the outside and we're having an internal experience from the external external experience. In other words, yes, we, we are having an external experience on the outside as well, right? One of the things she says is that our skin is the first receptor to experience what we're noticing. Temperature is one of those factors that we can notice. Then it comes in to be translated within the system, the interoceptive part of ourselves. That's now going to be like, well, what do I feel about that? You know, right? It's going to feel like, do I like that? What the extraceptors are saying, what do the interoceptors feel about that? And that, so, you know, one person might really like somebody's jovial energy, right? And it might enliven them, feel good inside their system. And the other person was like, that, that, that was jarring. It felt terrible in my system. So what is truth? Right. It's the and uh, Rick Hansen just had a great quote by Stephen Porges um, that we have, you know, same external experience, different internal experience. And I think that's so important. We 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 have very different introceptive experiences from the same external experience. So we can't sit there and say, well, that wasn't, that, no, that couldn't have been true because it wasn't true for me. No, no, it, we are having our own micro experiences. I think that's important because, you know, we, we think everybody's just like ours. I would never have done that. We, we think that we're all on the same planet. We're all in the, you know, everybody's on Christina planet or on Owen planet. We all come from your planet. But we really don't. We ha we really have our own little biospheres of experience. Yeah, and that's why you know these things can shift and change over time. So, you know, those experiences that affect you before don't affect you any longer, and you know things shift and change. Things are recorded and stored for later yes. use. And the body, we talk about the body keeping the score as being this thing of something that keeps the score of bad things. But no, 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 it keeps the score of the good stuff. It's, and I'm sure you saw a quote the other day that uh, was a Rick. I think it was Rick Hansen that said. If you didn't have the ability to have all of these receptors and taking all this information and logging in your brain, what's useful for next time, what's not? Like you said, if you're driving a car and you had no recorded memory of in any version of memory, the car experience would just be horrific because you'll be at speed. How do I deal with speed? Um, you know, cars coming up behind me or the temperature of the car, it would be way too much. You just crash. Um, so these things that we learn and encode are really actually quite important to to be able to drive a car on kind of autopilot i know that i can sometimes drive and go hang on a minute i don't remember the last five minutes of the journey that's not because i'm stuck in thoughts but it's interesting how my body and my being can drive the car without me even being really aware that i'm in this space it's kind of mind-blowing really i love what you're saying i love your term automatic pilot i i attune with that greatly because there are some things that I'm grateful that I can have that, you know, auto simplicity, let's say, of certain acts. However, what I want 
to help my clients become is not to be on automatic pilot with their nervous system. And unfortunately, I think until we recognize that our nervous system has been predetermined, that it was set without our conscious awareness. And so we are actually, I like to use the analogy, you know, if you've ever gone to a carnival and you're on a on one of those little trains that go around, you know, um, and you're sitting there and you've got a little wheel, you actually think you're, you know, you're driving the little um, wagon as it's moving all around, but actually there's this track and it's whipping you around. So you think you're turning right, but the tracks are taking you left. And I like to say that until we, you know, take responsibility and acknowledge and tune into our nervous system and what's going on, our nervous system is like those tracks. And it's running us on automatic pilot. And it can wreak a tremendous amount of havoc. So this is where I'd like us to become more manual. And I also think that, you know, we have beliefs that we have that kind of run on automatic pilot. You know, conditioning. So it's good to be conditioned how to ride a bike so I don't have to relearn it every time. But there are certain beliefs that are in automatic pilot like, Oh, you know, I have to go to church or, um, you know, it's wrong to, you know, not work, you know, five days a week. Or am I lazy if I take a nap in the middle of the day? Or, you know, is it wrong to be a stay at home mom? Or is it, you know, wrong to be a working mom? Or, you know, all of these limiting beliefs that we get adopted to subconsciously from our family of origin, from our community, from our gender, from our religion, from our society, these two can cause trauma in our system if we are, you know, if we're in a society that doesn't accept the way that we are, we choose to be, it can be very traumatizing to our nervous system. And we're seeing that right now you know, especially in America, but I believe around the world um, with the Black Lives Matter movement. So I think, you know, people of, you know, homosexuals experience this. There's many different belief systems that can um, cause trauma to our system that if we want to be true to ourself, it feels very scary, right? We activate the nervous system because we're not allowed to be true to ourselves because we're afraid we will be rejected by the tribe, by the society. So that's also traumatizing. Yet it is so much. And just pick up on something you said there about the automatic side of it is like, you know, when you bring mindful awareness to all activities that you're doing, it starts to open up a new experience with those very autopilot things that we're talking about. So sometimes I try and do this. If I'm listening to a podcast in the car and I'm just really into the podcast, not really paying attention to my journey or listening to music. And sometimes it's appropriate to listen to music and tune into the music and sing along and feel great, get some safe and social going. But sometimes I love to just turn all the audio off and really take, get, take, you know, get a sense of doing the pedals and, you know, the control I have over this wheel, the fact that I'm going, you know, 60 miles an hour and going, whoa, this is quite a big piece of metal to be driving at that kind of speed. And when you actually start tapping, you're like, this is a really cool skill to have that I can transport this vehicle yes. and all of these skills that I've learned. And then it brings this whole new yes. flavor to the driving experience. And I try and apply that to activities. I love and, that. You know, I've just taken on a job. Um, my audience don't know about this, but I've taken on a job doing night shifts at a supermarket just because needs must, coronavirus, uh, complete mess up my massage business. But I thought this is an opportunity for me to work at a supermarket like this where I'm replenishing sales, picking shopping for online orders, but do it in a mindful way. And it's been really fun, really fun to see how I move Beautiful. And, and how I interact with all these new people because I'm a newbie. I haven't been a newbie for a while. So looking at my nervous system around that, who I find a bit awkward to be around, who I feel really drawn to. When you find, you know, you know this, you find people that you're drawn to for the yes. first time. Like, oh my God, they're amazing. There's something about them whatever it is, it's a dance going on. You're like, this, this is my kind of guy. And that feels very special. Anyway, that's enough for me. Oh, that sounds, but I love that. I'd, I want, I want to make sure I tap into um, working with people with trauma. 
and the importance of that we really want to, I have such respect having had it myself for people who have trauma in their system. And I want to be mindful in saying that it isn't, you know, how, how do we work? How can I, let's say if somebody's listening to this and they think, you know, I think I, I have a lot of fear in my system. I, I seem agitated. I seem, uh, you know, afraid a lot of the time. I seem like I isolate myself or I seem, you know, kind of depressed a fair amount of the time. What can I, you know, maybe there's something that um, is in my nervous system and it might be, you know, chronic from my childhood. I'm not sure. What can I do to meet these needs? And what I kind of want to talk with you about, Owen, is it's very important that people, as they seek out support for their trauma, are careful because we can re we can trigger our trauma again. We can reactivate it and we can actually worsen it by reliving it. And that's one of the most important messages I really want to communicate to your audience is that I honor every person that I meet, that I will not allow them to have them retell me any traumatizing event because I know that it will be reactivating that nervous system and actually creating even a greater like scar in their system. And that there are very healthy, useful ways that we can heal trauma, that we can heal these traumatic events within the nervous system. Um, you know, there's, if you don't mind me just sharing that there are these differing techniques like EMDR, which is rapid eye movement therapy, which is a very effective means. There's sensor motory therapy, which is um, a tool that I use, bilateral stimulation. And ultimately, what we're wanting to help people do, and we're wanting people to access the traumatizing events or event while stimulating another part of their brain, the witnessing, that mindfulness part of the brain that you were alluding to just a few minutes ago. And that's why I wanted to make this connection, which is when we tap into this awareness part of our brain, and we simultaneously help someone experience the trauma at the rate of safety so that they do not leave their window of tolerance. What we're doing is we're not erasing the memory, but we're replacing the experience of the memory. We're rewiring so that they will have a new neural experience of that past traumatizing event, and it will not activate the nervous system in the same way. And that is really what we want for everybody. And I think that everybody, to a greater or lesser degree, has fear in the system. And I think that, you know, to all your audience members, this kind of work is so beneficial. You know, I can say my husband did not have trauma. And he benefits from turning within and sitting and doing this witnessing simultaneously with being, you know, doing this titration work. So we're not just reliving scary events that have happened in our past, you know, moments that we were afraid of. So I just really want to make sure that as we talk about mindfulness, because mindfulness is a beautiful element to healing our um, aggravated nervous system. It needs also to be met with this slow digestion of the trauma, right? We don't want to just eternally sit with the fear. We want to transmute it and actually process it uh, so that it can sit in a greater into greater well-being, you know, so that that little piece is just a small little piece in this well of well-being. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. That's very powerful. And I'm aware that we have freestyled this whole conversation. Um, I know, I'm so no, sorry. No, 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 it's brilliant because I was just looking at my questions before. Actually, we've been answering all of them 
through the flow of this conversation, which is great. But what I'm going to do is just anchor in one, I'm going to ask you one question, which is anchor to two of these questions. So two of the questions was, what does trauma therapy look like? I think what you just said there alone is a big part of that. And the next question was actually, what do we think of the key elements to trauma recovery? So what I want to throw at you, if you don't mind, is that I was listening to some, some stuff last night and talking about, you know, if you bring, if you've got intensity and calm, think of these as two separate experiences. So many people think they want to, they want to switch off this intensity and switch on calm rather than seeing as in if you bring the intensity and calm together, they can flow together and create an equilibrium that feels natural rather than trying to switch from one to the other. That's, that's my way of explaining the analogy. But what I found really interesting is that, like you said, you don't, you want the client to feel safe enough that they can tap a little bit into their pain within that moment but not so much that overwhelms them. And, you know, Peter Levine would call that pendulation. So pendulating in, pendulating out. Um, there's other words that you, you can use for it. I use it as like anchoring. So I will, I spend some time looking for a safe space in my body. So if I'm going to be doing any body work and sensing into discomfort, I make sure that I find a piece of my body that feels safe and warm and calm, whatever other words you want to use. So I use that as my anchor point so I can tip, dip, dip my toes in to a bit of my suffering and then come back to my safe space. And I think, I guess a big, would you say a big part of the trauma recovery journey and working with therapists is having that safety, but also instilling that client with the ability to search for safety within so they can hold it. Um, you need, to, they're kind of awakening the inner therapist within them is huge. So what, what are your thoughts on obviously safety? I know it's really obvious, but let's talk about it. No, I, and I love you. Just if I do my job well, you'll fire me and you'll hire you because you are the wisest therapist for yourself. And so I just love that you said that, you know, you are the inner therapist. We want to activate that wise one within. I also really appreciate the way that you described how you find your spot of safety. And this I do with all my clients. Uh, I have to, I start um, what I call bilateral stimulation, which I am activating different parts of their brain through an embodied approach. And then I usually pick a stimulus, like a current trigger that's getting activated that w that causes them to feel some kind of tightness or tension somewhere in the body. And we'll find that. What we then want to do is, and then there are just really some, there are so many creative tools of how can we titrate, which is what you were doing. How can I go from a place of safety to this pain body feeling? And so that there are different techniques that we can use where we invite the client to, as you were saying, dip their toe in it, to touch the hot, you know, I don't want to say the hot coal because you don't ever want to touch a hot coal, but, you know, to, to be with that heat and then find coolness, be with the heat and then find coolness. And what I find is it's, I, we, in, you know, the professional term is titration. It's this back and forth, back and forth that eventually gets to a sense of neutrality, right? Equanimity, acceptance, oneness, peacefulness, integration. And that's how we get there. And there are some, this is what we, so you know you're, you know, working with a good therapist if they are gently taking you in and out, never beyond your capacity. And I always say to a client, we will only go till you, you know, as far as you feel safe, you know, and, and the term is a window of safety. And yes, our goal as a therapist is to get that window to open up wider and wider and wider and wider so that their sense of safety grows greater and greater. And as you said, that sense of safety within themselves, you know, Clients only sit with me for an hour once a week, but they're with themselves, you know, 24 <laughs> seven. So they need to have access to safety all that other time. And so the sooner we can show them that it is within themselves, you know, the greater I feel 
that that client's going to be, you know, that they're on their road to healing, you know, to greater self acceptance. And this is really my work. I would say it's it's not a self improvement program. This is really about a self acceptance journey, and to realize that all of the greatness is within them, and it's just finding greater and greater capacity and clarity to see that within themselves. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I hope that answers that question. Yes, for it's you. amazing. Thank you. I could see you all day. <laughs> um, um, which, you know, it's fine for us, but not so probably so good for playing it back. <laughs> but it, you know, before we sort of look at our kind of the insights for the audience to finish up, I just wanted to touch yes. on, um, you know, for me, being a, compa- a compassionate observer of my experience, that's my language, that's the language I use. I always try and observe what's going on, but do it really compassionately because otherwise judgment kicks in, negativity bias will kick in. So do it like that. But also I, I want to say so because there's a lot of guys that will listen to this and there's a lot of guys at the beginning of their journey. And, you know, the one thing that always gets me down a little bit is when people kind of start to associate with their behavior. So they'll say, oh, my light's gone. They will say, um, I've always had a short temper, for example. I've always had this anger streak. And I'm like, that's not that's not a thing that you're dropping into fight and flight. So if you could be a compassionate observer of that and start to go from a Deb Dana perspective, triggers and glimmers, what is it that keeps triggering me out of safe and social into fight and flight? That's your question. You can be curious, be a witness in a really nice way and go, what is the common thing that tends to break, you know, get rid of my vagal break and I drop straight down. And it's a really nice language, I think, for men on beginning on their journey to start looking at that anger issues to say, what is it that's triggering me? And how can I look at what need is not being met? Because they often say that conflict, conflict between a couple especially is just needs not being met. That's where the conflict comes from. If your needs are being met, essentially there is no conflict. So right. especially couples can think about this too. What is it that they trigger in each other and where may that be stemming from? Because actually it's quite interesting when you start breaking it down. You're like, whoa, I realized that my mum never did this. And the fact that you're doing that is triggering me because it's not so I'm comfortable with you doing because I've never had it. And when you start thinking it that way, it opens up this whole world of experience and you can start to heal through that. So, you know, what we, do you sort of subscribe to that idea of being that observer of triggers and glimmers and vagal break and all that kind of thing? I do. You know, what I love through this work is also the strategies that we have adopted we adopted them as a means for survival. So I want to tell my clients and your audience that their techniques, you know, short-tempered, that, you know, somebody that loses their temper quickly, I have tremendous compassion for that person because that was a part of them when they were little probably that was trying to protect them. That was the defense mechanism trying to say, stop, you know, I can't tolerate it anymore. And so a lot of our, you know, quote unquote, ugly behavior that we adopted, we adopted as a means of survival when we were little, because we didn't, you know, nobody showed us a good toolkit. We just grabbed what we could. And so we grabbed these, you know, unfortunately, you know, in professional term, they call them maladaptive tools. You know, it's like we picked up a hammer when we should have picked up a, you know, a nice thread, but the hammer is what worked at the time. And so, you know, I nobody is intentionally wanting to be aggressive. Nobody is intentionally wanting to avoid or, you know, um, freeze. These were the strategies that we adopted. And oftentimes because they were modeled to us. It worked for mom. She got angry at dad or work for dad, shut mom right up, you know? So we adopt these tools and then we're like, why isn't it working? You know, as you're saying with relationship, like, well, I'm trying what my dad did with my mom, you know, <laughs> trying to argue with my wife and it's not working. She's not, you know, being quiet. What's happening here? And what we're realizing is, oops, <laughs> these tools that we adopted and we adopted them really from good intention for survival. It's not working anymore. And so can we now consciously consider adopting some new effective tools that will really get us what we want. 
our needs to be met. And that's really what I would invite, you know, your your audiences. I so support each and every one of us. I'm not excluded from losing my temper. You know, I'm not excluded from having um, maladaptive strategies. But I can tell you this much. I don't get what I want when I use them. <laughs> I usually activate fear in the other person because fear begets more fear. So if I show up with aggression, let me tell you, I'm going to get some form of fear right back at me. And it usually ain't pretty. And so when I use my adaptive strategies, you know, a request instead of a demand, you know, and what's a request instead of a demand? A request is that, would you mind helping me? And I know it's a request because I'm not resentful if you say, I can't help you right now. Can I help you later? And if I'm pissed that you say you can't help me now, then guess what? My request, it wasn't really a request. It was a demand in a cute little request costume. And so these are kind of the tools and techniques I try to help my clients adopt so that we're not triggered by, you know, when I was little, my needs weren't met. And so the only no way I know how to get my needs met is to demand them because I'm scared they're not going to be met. So these are the kinds of, they're new, you know, this is why your podcast is so useful. There's so many great tools now out there. There weren't. This is new. This was not here 20 years, pardon me, 20 years ago. So, you know, I wish it was here when I was growing up. I, not, I wish it was here when I was in my 20s. I feel like if I could have adopted these strategies in my early 20s, gosh, the amount of clarity and the lack of anxiety and fear, I could have saved myself. Whew. Like red carpet all the way it's so true and i like to you know think about it is if you had a life where you didn't have an anger response or a fight response you're not going to survive very long um on this planet let's be honest you know if you don't have you need the anger to, to protect you know protect yourself from a dog trying to you know maul you to death if you don't have that you're a goner so and we need it to drive you know if there's a lorry yes. hurling towards you you need an element of fight and flight so let's not be silly and say we're yes. taking anything away we're just trying to create a different experience yes. which is a lot safer which is amazing so uh, before we head off today if anybody that's listening to the show who i'm going to more focus this on people who are just starting their trauma journey people that listen to this going wow you know there's a lot going on for me i think i, I think i might be ready to to make a start on this, what would be be kind of your if, insight for them to think about before they take take that jump? Well, I think we have to ask: Is what I'm doing now to deal with my stress working for me? Like, how am I doing now? Because we have to be motivated to want to try a different approach, right? So, you know, I have a saying: We, we, you know, at the very beginning, we said life is suffering, but no, what I'm really, what I've realized is when we've suffered enough, you know, and we call uncle, <laughs> like, okay, I can't take it anymore. That's when we really want to seek advice, support. And um, for anybody out there who's interested in like saying, well, you know what? I'm curious about maybe addressing this. I would encourage uh, the listeners to consider looking to find someone um, that has a somatic background, somebody who's trained, that has a background in trauma therapy, and that includes somatic therapy as well. I really think that that's important. I think that I, I would only want to help your audience, and I wouldn't want anybody to be, quote unquote, re-traumatized um, in that process. So those would be the two variables that I'd really consider. I think, you know, listening to podcasts, listening to Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps a Score, is a great read if you want to see like, hmm, this might be something that I, you know, maybe this is for me. Deb Dana's um, book and the podcast that she had, It Sounds True, is excellent. I think Steve Porges has um, got some great stuff to listen to. And I also think Rick Hansen. You know, these are just a few great um, authors. One of the teachers that I have followed, also in a woman named by Janina Fisher, she's written some great books for individuals to address 
their own trauma as well. So if we want to consider, could I just kind of see, like, could I read some things about surviving trauma? Maybe I'd like to read a Janina Fisher book about it and understand a little bit more what would I want to be engaging in? What would it look like and feel safe in my own space before I go out and meet a therapist? And I could totally see that being as a first step as well. So, um, you know, and I invite anybody who's interested in shooting me an email. Um, I'm open uh, trying to help people find therapists around the world. Um, my goal is to, my motto is fear less so that you can love more. And um, so, you know, that's really why I got into this business. That's amazing. Thanks so much. Well, I'm going to put links to all your businesses and such like in the description of the video, but it's such thank that, you. Such sound advice that that you've given there and it's, you know, finding the right therapist that makes you feel safe, you know, really if it doesn't feel quite right and you're feeling a bit triggered by it, I if you don't yes. feel if you don't feel you can tell them that, then there's probably a problem there maybe you should, you know, and it's okay. To, it's it's okay to work your way through a few people until you find what you need. Yes. Oh, I love that. Oh, and that is great insight. We are not meant for everybody and everybody's not meant for us. And you have to trust your sense of that. What does it feel like listening to them? You know, do they seem to, you know, cut me off or do they hear me? Do I feel heard? And I think those are great recommendations, Owen. I know plenty of people who have, you know, had a couple misses before they have a hit. And and so I encourage you, definitely try more than one so that you can have a sense of flavor. Like, oh, you know, I thought I liked this person, but wow, once I talk to that person now, I really know what it means to feel safe when you talk to someone else. Yes, I agree with you. Definitely. Um, yeah, well, there's, you know, there's plenty more we can say, and I have a feeling that we're probably going to have to do a part two. <laughs> I love this. that. But um, I feel like there's so, there's been so much in this conversation, I'm sure is going to have to be helping our listeners. And I hope everybody listening right now has got value out of this. I just want to thank you so much for your time today. Oh, and thank you so much for this time. I really enjoyed it. And, you know, I just, the more we can um, destigmatize trauma and anxiety and stress and depression and realize that we don't have to live from that, that we can be free of this, that to me is really the message I would love to impart to everybody. And and I know this to be true from my own direct experience. And I invite you listeners to find this out for yourself. Don't believe me. Be your own detective and, and see if this is going to be true for you too. It's amazing. And like we said earlier, everybody, you know, you have an inner therapist within you. So it's waiting, it's waiting for you. It's waiting for you to, you know, we, we innately want to survive as humans. Our body, our minds will always look after us. It wants us to survive. It's, it's built in. So it's waiting for you. You just need someone to facilitate that with you. Um, and it's just finding that person and they're out there somewhere. So don't go anywhere. I'm going to find out what's next for you and also where we can find you online. I'm just going to thank my patrons a second and then we'll be back to it. So um, thank you very much, everybody that supports us on Patreon. I can't thank you enough for your kindness. Your donations every month really allow me more time to do what I love. And hopefully all the listeners get value out of that, too. So thank you so much to Mike Morgan, Emerald McLeod, Maggie Palmer, Daniel Billing, Roland Chesters, Hannah Irvin, Karen Goodson, Julie Ferris, Stella Statti, and of course, my amazing co-hosts, Stephen Truelove and Daryl Osborne over on my other podcast. You can sign up to the Man Cove Wellbeing community at the link in the description of this video or visit www.patreon.com slash mc. W. There's a range of benefits over there and the coaching coves are coming soon. Don't you worry. It's going to be some amazing groups for men to hang out with coaches in a live stream. And it's going to be also awesome. It's coming soon. You can find out more about us at mancovewellbeing.com. So, Christina, uh, what does the rest of 2020 look like for you? What, what's the what's the plan if there is one? <laughs> right. Well, um, continuing to see clients. Um, I am... I have a blog that I kind of took a siesta from and now I'm going to wake back up to and just basically share my journey of, you know, awakening to my true authentic self, what it took. Um, so I am going to go back to my 
um, writing and hopefully um, get to do more opportunities such as this, you know, communicating to a larger and larger audience about um, trying to heal our nervous system and live from our most true self. Oh, that's beautiful. Thanks so much. And where's the best place to find you online? Is it is Instagram, Facebook? Where, where's best? Um, I think, you know, so I have an Instagram, Christina Giamalva um, is my Instagram handle, I guess. I don't know what the right word is for that. And um, if you're interested in following me, um, you can send me an email via ChristinaGiamalva.com. My hashtag on that one is peace piece by piece. Um, and I'm open to any insight. Um, I love people's stories. I love to facilitate, um, you know, connect people with other people in any way that I can. can. So if um, you think I might be of help, reach out to me. Amazing. Brilliant. Again, I will put links into everything so people can find it below. So yeah, I'm really excited. We will definitely do more work together in the future. Don't worry about that. I would be honored, Owen. Great stuff. Well, thank you so much for your time and I will speak to you soon. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, Owen. Yeah, no problem. Thank you everybody for listening. We'll be back next time for some more wellness chitty chat. As you all know by now, I have at least six or seven unbelievable human beings lined up to do interviews with next week. So uh, keep watching. I can't, I can't cope with the amount of amazing human beings that are now in my life, but I, I'll survive. It'll be fine. So have a wonderful day. Stay safe, everybody. Support your friends and take care of that nervous system. You need it and it's there for you. So show it lots of love and compassion. Thank you for listening and we will see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.